and welcome to Palace Confidential, your weekly look at all things royal, brought to you from the Mail's Kensington HQ. I'm Jo Elvin and joining me today is the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden, a return to the programme for historian and author Dr Tessa Dunlop, and in between these old sparring partners, we have the Mail on Sunday's editor-at-large, Charlotte Griffiths. Welcome. What a, what a trio. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. A little bit nervous, but excited. Where else to start this week but with the Duchess of Sussex? Not only have we had the second instalment of her podcast, Archetypes, and an interview with Mariah Carey, more on that in a moment, but first we are going to look at the interview with Meghan that's made the news across the world. I presume you know she invited the US publication The Cut into her Montecito home, even taking them on the school run. I'm going to start with you, Richard. <laughs> Lucky you. Now, one of the big talking points from this extraordinary interview was a line where she talks about forgiveness. And in her words, knowing that I can say anything, quote unquote. The interview is suggesting that Meghan's comment was full of meaning. Do you agree with that? I think it really was. I mean, what was notable about the interview it wasn't so much what Meghan did say, it was what she didn't say. And she made a series of very unsubtle hints that she could say a lot more in the future. And it seemed to be clear that they were threats. She was coming across as saying, I can say these things, I've chosen not to. She made clear I haven't signed any contract stopping me from talking about what went on when I was active member of the royal family mm. and and it was all spelled out in that way and she even dropped a hint by saying i was keeping a, a daily diary as well it's fascinating is it what do you think the palace has made of it um nervous probably sort of very weary um you know they, i'm sure they'll have read the interview and just think Oh, what next? I mean, the timing as well, on the eve of their visit to Britain, mm. it's really shocking in, in so many ways. Um, Prince Harry, Charlotte, made another broadside statement about the family, a strange comment about how many of my family aren't able to live and work together. Now, do you imagine that the Cambridges might have a view on that? Yeah, I mean, if he means... The Cambridges, I think William and Kate work beautifully together. The one person that the Cambridges couldn't work with is Prince Harry. So he had to move out of Kensington Palace. Um, I don't know if he's alluding to something to do with Clarence House and maybe Prince Charles being difficult to work mm. with. It's, it's ambiguous, as usual. But, uh, you know, I think the Cambridges work beautifully together and uh, very much they all sort of stick together, the remaining royals, don't they? But I, I can tell that you're dying to say yeah. something. Oh, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I, what's interesting about that article in the car, I thought they'd taken a slice out of your pie, Richard. I thought the journalist in question was pretty ungenerous to Meghan. A lot of what wasn't said was her kind of, you know, judgment over this extremely rich house, this mega opulence, and also- Is that she, unfair though? What, but, but I think that the palace would have been almost relieved. Somebody in America batting on their side. I mean, the journalist in question basically says what a lot of us, I think, now realise is that Meghan went into the royal family, scooped up the tinsel and the title and went back to America and has started working with those credits and bigging up her own image and making her own products. And, and I would say, to an extent, fair play to her. Well, that, that's the way of the world. You say that, but... Speaking of bigging up her own image, the thing that really raised my eyebrows is this story about the South African actor who she said had told her that back home in South Africa people danced in the streets when she married into the royal family the way that they did when Nelson Mandela was freed. That's a bit yeah, much, isn't it? Th that was unfortunate. I think occasionally Meghan needs a little bit of a reality check and I went to bed with her and Mariah Carey last night. <laughs> How was and, that? Well, I was very relieved that dear old Mariah, who's more my generation than Meghan's... Is there any... Is there room for three divas in that... <laughs> in that <bed? laughs> I was having a pillow fight with her, but I felt I got in there somewhere. But, um, and she did rain check Meghan. She goes, come on, girl, you're a diva. And Meghan at the end has the epiphany that maybe being a diva isn't such a bad thing after all. <laughs> you know, but... but I've got to admit that Meghan has a lovely voice, it's well produced, she likes having a platform, which begs the question, why did she marry into the royal family? Because that was all always going to be taken away from her. I mean, what I would say to Tessa is if Meghan's so happy say and su me, successful and everything's going great, why do they keep having to make these digs at the royal family? They, why do they have to bring everything back I don't think they to do. the royal family? The journalists, the journalists are naturally going to do that. I don't know. I feel like there was a lot of un, 
solicited comments about yeah, she's the family. She spontaneously brought the royal family think, up know, every five minutes. It's not Harry's interview. Harry walks in and drops that thing about how his family can't work oh, together. Oh, Harry's yeah. a different question. Right. I think Harry is struggling with it. Poor old Harry. I mean, who's front of the cut? It's Meghan. Who's hosting the podcast? It's Meghan. Where's Harry? Harry who? H? I feel sorry for Harry. I'm, he's like the in-between guy. But Meghan's off there in the, in, in the fast lane, as far as I'm concerned. There were mm. some other claims she made in the interview, Richard, that um, some royal com correspondents here have been questioning. Um, yes, I mean, she said things about the media, which was, it was hard not to get angry about, frankly, because they were just simply untrue. What such, Meghan, such as? Well, what Meghan was doing was that thing which she and Harry seemed to specialise in, of sort of throwing mud out there, making, being quite coy, not being specific, but making these claims which just don't stand up at all. The most offensive of which was she said that um, she accused the media of... Um, insulting her children yeah. using the N-word. Well, that, that has never happened. But that was also... I was unclear on whether that was a dig at the media or the consumers of the media. I couldn't, I couldn't figure that British. out. Or the British. It's yeah, 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 that yeah. we, the British, are yeah. these racist old fuddy-duddies that, yeah. that she had to escape from. It's uh, kind of insulting all of us. I think that's deliberate, that she wants the, the readers of this article to think, oh, yeah, that's the British media, they're dreadful, when... Uh, and she can't be accused of being too specific. What was so fun it was, was very she, damaging. She wanted the interviewer to agree with her, and she thought the interviewer would. And the interviewer was very, yes, very clever and didn't particularly. And actually, as you said, the interviewer yeah. was pretty anti Megan and wrote it so beautifully and carefully and cleverly. And she also made another uh, untrue claim, which is important for us to address, which is she talked about if they'd stayed in Britain their children would face every day on the school run, sort of 40 photographers mm. pestering them. Well, this is just not the case at all. So I, I wonder, I, you know, I feel duty-bound to play devil's advocate a, a, yeah. a, a little bit. I wondered if that was Harry's experience when the press regulation wasn't quite as stringent um, as but it is I, now. I, no, even in the case of Harry and William, yeah. um, they'd have a photo call on their first day at school yeah. with, you know, a couple of photographers, but after that they're left alone completely, and that's the case with the Cambridge's children. And as Charlotte would tell you, you know, from her days as a diarist, you know, we, we've been offered countless stories about the children, but we don't touch them because yeah, of an agreement that we let the children live their lives while they're still at school. So mm. it's just wrong for Megan to say that, and she seems to be saying these untrue things to gain sympathy from an American audience. But the bigger picture is, surely, is that in America, where success is much more judged on money, and, and status and the brand. She's blown it out of the water. She's top of the Spotify rankings. Everyone's talking about her, whether negative or positive. Yeah. And I think that's a nightmare for the Cambridges going forward. Their children, you know, is everybody or anybody who's going to want to marry those children, is it going to be for the tinsel, the mantle, mm. you know, to run off into the sunset and create some other idea of royalty? I think this is, is, is actually a longer term nightmare for the institution of monarchy in our country because it can be filched, you know, take, take a bit of it and run off. It, it, it's kind of mm. cruel almost. I wonder if Charles will be sort of like taking that under advisement but as we Charles speak, What can Charles do, though? Actually. It makes Charles look like he's come from the, another decade, another century. Yeah. It's so interesting. I mean, speaking of what you said about Harry and sort of like feeling sorry for him, I, I wonder, Charlotte, if the flip side of that, so Harry sort of like keeps coming in and making these appearances in, in the podcast mm -hmm. and, and such, that maybe there's a sense that she or her paymasters need him to be involved. They sort of need him and they don't because he was supposed to be in the original Spotify series, do you remember? And the first mm. one did have a lot of him in and clearly it was very scripted and Meghan can pull off scripted quite well. Mm. I personally see through it. Harry wasn't pulling it off so well. So actually I think it's the other way around. I think she's sort of said, listen, you can have a walk-on cameo. <laughs> do you remember that time when he juggled in the window uh, uh, yeah. in the background of one of her Unfortunately I do, yes. <laughs> like, I think she's like, oh, you're exposing us for being a bit fake because you haven't had your acting lessons. So you can just remind everyone why I'm famous and you're then keep, your, ma cynic, and then keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and like just, she's probably pre-programmed him to drop one truth bomb and then that's it. But, and then but, 
off. It, that works with the feminist narrative, the lean in. Look, here is the house husband with bare feet. Can they not afford shoes? He's always in bare feet. It's really curious. Their, their floors are so clean but, because of their but, mountains but, of staff. But, but you know what really got me in the end? It's always the small detail. Because I have got to say, I have enjoyed her podcast. I'm just putting it out there, girlfriends. I, mean, I didn't know that Mariah Carey's mother was an opera singer. You know, she does bring big fame to, 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 to my yeah, pillowcase. Did you learn one single thing from about Serena Williams, though? The first, Not a single thing. Megan interrupts her every five seconds. Okay, she was nervous. The first one was a bit shaky, but I like the Mariah Carey one. But back to their lifestyle. You know, they are meant to be eco-warriors. I always believed in them. And they have a watered lawn in California, mm. a and, verdant and, green lawn. And the person who did the interview made that very clean, yeah. clear. That was a real dig. Yeah, it was a dig. I like that. I've got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm kind She's of... She's a genius. I do. I, I'm ambivalent. I'm like one of those voyeurs. I feel like I felt with Diana. I can't stop consuming it. Well, it, I, I, it's interesting that you bring up Diana because one commentator this week suggested that the royal family are making the same mistake with Meghan and Harry as they did with Diana, sort of like sticking their fingers in their ears and just pretending it's not happening. Do you agree with that? I think they've got to own it. They've got to love bomb. I, I, if I was the royal family, I would love bomb the Sussexes. Charles did do that. Charles did come out. I think doing there, there has been attempts though, right? Do it more publicly. Do Charles, it more boldly. Charles, sources close to Charles came yeah. out and said, I really love both my sons Great. equally and I'm very saddened um, to hear that he feels he might have lost me. So he actually is reacting, which is uh, unusual yeah, for the royal family. I couldn't disagree with Tessa more. I mean, the idea of <laughs> love... That's right, Charlotte, it's sitting there. Yeah. The, the idea of <laughs> love of bombing the Sussexes, it's ridiculous. All they do is throw mud back in the faces of the royal family. Well, that's why I think maybe the high road is the bit, is the good option. And that, that would be the high road, wouldn't it? I, I think that they should... Well, no, the high road should be just to kick them off the road. No. They shouldn't have any royal titles anymore. It's time to Well, really I mean, this, this, this is the thing that keeps coming back, though, isn't it? Is that, you know, we're, the, the royal family is this dreadful institution that I had yeah. to escape, and yet I am actually the Duchess of Sussex. I want to know what you think of her sort of, like, clinging on to that title. I think she's a savvy businesswoman, and she understands that the Americans love a bit of royal you know scaffolding and she's taken a bit of that scaffolding and can you blame from, her? from the institution that she can't stand from the institution that she's working through her pain with she's still got pain there. I see okay. you know the cup posted on Twitter saying Megan of Montecito has done an interview Megan and Montecito. then about 20 minutes later deleted it and reposted yeah. it as Megan the Duchess of Sussex so I think all. somebody yeah. picked up the phone and said you missed out the most important bit of my name thank you very much exactly but that's fascinating but, but we could argue that that is a win for monarchy. That is a win. In the end, she's saying she needs that title. So, so we should own that. And I think we should walk out a bit more proudly. That, that actually, you're right. There's nothing there if it wasn't for the British monarchy. Mm. Mm. Richard, there was an interesting story as well this week, wasn't there, linking the, it to the investigation into the alleged bullying at the palace? Yeah, this seemed to be a bit of a reaction already to the interview from courtiers at the palace who were making clear that if um, the alleged victims of Meghan's bullying in the past wanted to speak out, they would be backed by the palace. That generally you think, oh, people have signed tight contracts, which mean they can't speak out publicly. Well, they were making clear in this article, appeared in the Daily Telegraph, that um, actually you can, you have a legal right to mm. be a whistleblower um, if, if you're reporting on something of public interest and they felt this would fall into that category. So it did come across as, look, you know, Megan's hinting about more she can disclose. Well, if you do, you know, there, wow. may, there may be a response. It's getting really nasty. Oh. Do you think there's people at the palace thinking, maybe we should start making people sign some things, actually? <laughs> this is just, like, it's extraordinary as well because, obviously, again, there's, there's new worries over the Queen's health. Yeah. It's dreadful timing. Yeah, but families are complicated. Yeah, Harry is, he's a vulnerable lad. Like this, this week we've had the anniversary, 25th anniversary of Diana's death. It's like a, we need to remember the horror that, that underlay that. I've been doing a lot of research recently on the Queen, a big biography about the Queen, published just a couple of years before Diana died. And the tone, the anti-Diana tone, we forget how horrible we were about well, his Well, I, I was making that point off camera earlier. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and actually he, he scarred. And he looks to Meghan for strength, for resourcefulness, for a way out of something that he felt trapped in. Well, I don't want to sound mm. cynical, but do we really think the Sussexes care about the Queen's health? I hope they do a little bit. I mean, yeah. my goodness, yeah. they gave that Oprah interview when Prince Philip was dying in hospital. They went ahead. There was talk about, oh, we might postpone it if he dies or whatever. But they went ahead with it. 
and as if it didn't matter at all. So the idea they might change their plans because of the Queen's health, I really think but is for the they might go and they visit might her. Want to visit her. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, do you think they'll go and visit yeah, her? Yeah, I think they've got themselves into a position where it's going to be too difficult to visit her. It's too embarrassing for them. That there'll be a hostile reception. Everyone will be on their guarded. Um, duty. I just, I think they've got themselves into a position where this could be their last chance. I hope it's not to visit the Queen in Balmoral, and they might have lost it because of their own publicity. Let, let's move quickly on to this new episode of Meghan's podcast. Richard, have you been to bed with Mariah and Meghan yet? <laughs> <laughs> did you make I, I it did listen this one? to a bit of it. I mean, yeah. how, many week, how many weeks do I have to listen to this podcast? I'm I don't not know, sure. How I many could are there? There's about it. eight. I think there's eight in this oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 me. You're trying to kill me in this job. Not me. Not um, me. But no, it's the same old thing. Look, I was interested in hearing about Mariah Carey. You know, she's a great figure, just like Serena Williams. And I, I was hoping for some interesting details about her past. But again, it was Meghan. It was Meghan in the headlines. The story that came out this time was about how Meghan had only started to see herself as black after going out with Prince Harry. And, and it, she seemed to turn it around, so again, it was all about her. And that's not really what I would hope for from an interview with superstars like Mariah Carey and Serena Williams. It did make me wish that I'd kept from my Glamour magazine days the rider we had when we did a shoot with Mariah Carey. Oh, yeah, what was that? <laughs> She's well earned that diva title. That's, that's all I can say. No, but um, diva's not bad. That's yeah, what yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, she yeah. was saying. Megan's a diva too. But, well, that's the thing that was the one thing that stuck out, wasn't it, Charlotte? Mm -hmm. Megan's shock when Mariah called her a diva. I know, Megan has misunderstood her own podcast. <laughs> Megan spent the whole time going, actually, diva's not a bad word, and we should turn this around. Then Raya calls her a diva, and she has a complete meltdown. How dare you yeah. call me a diva? It's literally the entire point what, of her podcast. What do you think it says about her feelings, about her own image? She cannot take any criticism whatsoever. And not only that, but, but she, she, she reacted at the time. And then she went into post-production, yeah. sat down and recorded a whole new segment yeah. saying how offended she was. Maybe a day later it would have been recorded, maybe a week later. Goes to show she doesn't let things just go no, by. I felt that she, she worked through stuff in that podcast. She had an epiphany at the end she that maybe Diva epiphany. could work both ways. But she's not talking to me. She's talking to a girl... 20 years younger than me, who's hearing her? They're wanting to live like Meghan with a verdant lawn and a barefoot <laughs> husband and palm trees that unite under the ground like yeah. Harry and Meghan's love. You've lost me at the intertwining palm trees. <laughs> That's enough. I'm done. I can't handle it anymore. But with all the excitement around Meghan's many media moments, it was perhaps easy to forget that there have been more headlines around the financial affairs of some of the charities linked to the Prince of Wales. The Mail on Sunday's Kate Manzi broke the cash for honours story and she brings us the latest and a roundup of what's been going on. How do they fund this very, very expensive project? Well, millions and millions of pounds were required to make Charles's ambition a reality, the foundation. So lots of donors were called upon. And last year we broke the story that uh, a man called Dimitri Luce, who's a Turkmenistan-born former banker, had uh, decided to donate generously to the Prince's Foundation. He decided he was going to give £500,000. He went through a couple of fixers who were known to work with the Prince of Wales and the charity, gave them the money, he was given the bank details, thought he was donating directly to the Prince's Foundation, and got a letter of thanks from the Prince of Wales in return. It transpired, in fact, that only £100,000 of his £500,000 donation ever made it to the foundation. And subsequently, the foundation said, oh, there's a red flag here, um, because we don't know this donor. Um, he had served four years in prison for money laundering causes in Russia. Now, he was wrongfully arrested, it's important to say, and those convictions were overturned. And, but nevertheless, the foundation saw fit to return the money, which means that £400,000 was still missing for, for a long time. The latest twist in a very long, very shady saga is that he's finally got £200,000 back through various other funds. Um, which means that he's got £300,000 back, £200,000 is still missing. In another bizarre twist, it transpires that the £200,000 he's got back actually had been diverted through another donor's bank account, it transpires, or it seems, and this is the subject of a charity commission investigation. 
Meanwhile, we've got the Metropolitan Police investigating um, the very serious case of cash for honours. Now, this relates to Michael Fawcett, who had to step down. He was Charles's right-hand man for many, many years, and he had written a letter, as we revealed in the Mail on Sunday, offering help to a Saudi sheikh to uh, improve his uh, honour to a knighthood and also to get British citizenship. Now, if that doesn't make your head spin, I don't know what does. On the other hand, we've got the Prince's Fund. Very distinct, according to the people who work for the Fund and the Foundation. In fact, the Fund does give some money to the Foundation, so not entirely distinct. But the Fund were the people who also um, managed to benefit from a massive suitcase of cash which was handed over um, from another foreign donor directly to the Prince of Wales and then went straight into the bank. There's no suggestion anybody was taking any of those used notes and putting them in their pockets. Nevertheless, it doesn't look very good at all. And then on top of that, we've got a separate, so a third investigation going on in Scotland and that's the Scottish charity regulator, which is where Dumfries House is obviously based they're investigating as well uh, to find out what was going on at the charity, where the money was coming from, whether it was going to the right place. And it's such a murky story. And as someone said to me last week in relation to the Dimitri Luce uh, donation, somebody said to me, you would expect this in Russia. You wouldn't expect this in Britain and certainly not at a charity that's linked to the heir to the throne. So it's such an extraordinary story. It, there's so many twists and turns to it, but it's not going away. I think now that they're really gonna to have to look seriously at the Prince of Wales's charities. He could be king any moment. Um, and it's not really appropriate that this is going on in the background. It probably is time for him to parcel off some of those charitable uh, causes, however well-meaning, um, and to focus on supporting existing charities, I would say, rather than ploughing lots of money and effort into, into ones that he's set up. That was Kate Manzi. We'll bring you more on that story as it develops. Richard, Charles could be king very soon. Doesn't he need to, you know, take some definitive action over this? I think he really does. I mean, you know, as Kate Mansey has previously said on this programme, I think he needs to do what he's um, done with the Prince's Trust to an extent and try and separate himself from these charities, certainly before he becomes king. Um, I mean, mm. personally, I'd like him to go further and, and close them down. But I think if... Close the Prince's Trust down? Well, not if it's already operating at arm's length, that's fine. But that's the key thing that, I mean, when he becomes king, he shouldn't have any charities that he's um, still directly involved in. They need to be completely separated or at least at arm's length from him. Charlotte, with organisations like the Prince's Trust, it's you've done so much undeniable good work over the years. But does all of this murkiness tend to have the risk of tarnishing that? Yeah, I think it totally taints it. And it's also confusing and murky and there are Fortnum and Mason bags flying around. <laughs> 200 grand sort of went well, missing. Well, it could be worse. They could be as done. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that yeah. would be worse. Yeah. I think he needs to somehow streamline or consolidate his charitable efforts. There just needs to be so much more clarity than there is now. Otherwise, you're right, it will totally tarnish the reputation of the good charity. But there's very really strict rules that govern the way in which donations can be received well, by charities. So I don't understand why there's so much difficulty around following those rules. Mm. Just because he's a poor judge of character employs well, get questionable people. Well, get him away from it then. Get him away. He's the figurehead. It's like the queen in politics. She's not guddling around in the day-to-day. -day. She's the symbol. Get yeah. him away from the money. Mm. Anyway, speaking of the Queen Tessa, um, she'll be receiving the new Prime Minister at Balmoral soon, well, which is unprecedented. It is. It's, it's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And maybe that's why there's no room for Harry and Meghan up there. Um, she... Th this isn't... It, it is unprecedented in so far as um, a new prime minister has never been asked to form a government from Balmoral. Um, but it was done from Osborne House, for instance, under Victoria. Disraeli had to get on a boat uh, and he decided that meant he'd climbed the greasy pole. So there are historical examples of a, of a monarch saying, come to me. Um, it, this is the biggest constitutional role she has, really. One is receiving the resignation of a prime minister and the other is asking a, a prime minister to form a government. And I, everyone said, oh, this is another sign of slippage. It's another sign that, you know, the, 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 the monarchal light is fading, um, the twilight of her reign. 
I would say, and I'm someone who works a huge amount with women in their very late 90s and 100s, this is a sign she's still actively in the game, that she wants to yeah. ask the new prime minister. Mm -hmm. I think she she's worried about the state of Britain. You know, we are in a crisis Why? mode at the moment. What's wrong? <laughs> Everything's fine, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Megan yeah. is our escapism. That yeah. says it all. Yeah. Um, so I think she probably wants to have a quiet word with the new prime minister. And I, I take that as a good sign. Of course, she doesn't want to schlep down to Buckingham Palace from her holidays. Do you Who think, would? Do you think, Richard, you know, another tradition, obviously, she always likes to stand up to greet the Prime mm. Minister. Is that something that is possibly at a risk? Well, certainly, you know, they just talk about these episodic mobility issues, um, but I, I'm sure you, you'll have a picture of her meeting the new Prime Minister and probably standing mm. up. But it seems to be um, very much doctors who advised that there was no need to take the risks of this long journey. Um, remember, she was only going to be coming to London that. Doing a few duties yeah. and coming straight back. Mm. Um, so I'm sure she'll come back to Windsor as normal once her holiday's finished. But it just seemed a bit excessive, and I think everyone's very, very careful um, with the Queen's health, and that, that's right. Let her just have one uninterrupted summer. <laughs> well, and I guess it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't that long ago, was it, that we didn't even realise we'd be looking for a new Prime Minister? Well, so exactly. Yeah. Well, she has yeah. Yeah. Elections are October and May, and the other thing is, the Queen has staked her identity on the United Kingdom. Is it so bad to ask a Prime Minister of Great Britain to form a government from Scotland? I think this is a win It'll for our a, United Queen. It'll be a fantastic trip for the future Prime Minister. Yes, good practice. They have to yeah. go up every summer. Yeah, lucky them. That is all we have time for on Palace Confidential today. My thanks to Richard Eden, Dr Tessa Dunlop, Charlotte Griffiths and to you, the viewers who watch from as far afield as the US, Canada, Australia, hi my old mates, South Africa, <laughs> Singapore, <laughs> Germany and many, many more. We love having you along for the ride and we do hope you can join us again next week. Goodbye.